Hello and welcome to Quality of Life. Today our subject deals with education and joining us today are the principals from Sheboygan North and Sheboygan South. Uh, Sheboygan North we have Jason Bold, principal. Welcome Jason. Thank you for having me. Excellent. And then from Sheboygan South we have Mike Trimberger. Thank you for having me. You bet. Um, to start off with um, how long have you guys been in the roles that you are principal roughly? This is, uh, I'll be concluding my third year as principal at North, and I was an associate principal at North for three years prior to that. Okay. Uh, I was fortunate. I, I think Jason and I, it was uh, the same summer we got hired. So this is also my third year, so we've okay. kind of got to sharpen our teeth together in some cases. And uh, before that, I was an elementary principal at Sheridan Elementary in Sheboygan for three years. Okay, great. When we talk about education and how it you know, deals with quality of life, um, how, how is that relation and how do they play one role play with the other? Or what influence does education have on one's quality of life to start off with? Uh, you know, I think one of the things that, that we try to convey to our students is being a lifelong learner. You know, what can you do to make sure that you're always learning? Um, you know, it, there's a lot of different pathways that students can choose career-wise, uh, going right into the workforce, going into uh, two-year college, four-year college, things like that. It doesn't matter as long as you're a lifetime learner and you're always trying to strive to get better, it's going to make you better at whatever you do. Okay. I think along with that, we talk to our students about education should, in addition to a lifelong piece, it should make, provide an opportunity to be successful and to be happy. And success and happiness must be measured by our individual students um, and, and prepare them to make a positive impact in their community. Mm -hmm. Piggyback onto that, why is education so important? You know, I think there's a lot of um, information out there that says that the, the level of education can uh, be correlation to how much your salaries are going to be. So, you know, in some cases for people, the level of education can be how much you're going to make, uh, satisfaction of jobs, things like that. Um, but really, as you look at it from a community standpoint, the better educated community we have, the, the more successful we're going to be at a community, the better we're going to be from our, from our people and engineers to our CEOs uh, to, the, to our uh, students that are going to work on production lines or, or work in other areas. The more educated they are, the better they're going to be able to give to uh, the Sheboygan community. I would totally agree. A, a more educated, informed population turns into a well-functioning, thriving community. Okay. You know, you're from the high school education, but you know you have dealings with you know people, kids come in from elementary as well as then on to college. Is there any certain type of education that is more influential on our quality of life? You know, like high school education to life expect uh, life experiences to, you know, does it all fit together as part of a transit, or is there one more influential than the other? Sure. I think it truly is. High school, elementary are all pieces of a puzzle. Um, there's no doubting the power and impact of the early stages of life where it's not formal education, but it's experiential. Mm -hmm. It's uh, learning traditions and culture. Um, experiential learning is continued through all ages, but coupled with formal education, those, those are the many pieces of the puzzle that, that provide a well-rounded, again, educated and informed individual. And I'm really getting excited with some of the things that we're doing in the district with uh, technology about how much we can personalize learning. Because, you know, elementary, middle school, those foundations are so important. Um, in high school, as, as the brain matures, they get uh, um, different biases, different things like that. And when we can start personalizing and saying this is the level this means lifelong learning to me or this means lifelong learning to me can be totally different and when we can individualize and break that down that's when we can really get to that next level of education and make sure that everybody's learning to their potential. I think that really goes back to success and happiness as measured by that individual. Mm -hmm. You know as Mike yeah. said is it's personalized so if we can provide opportunities for our students to be exposed to many things, different courses, different experiences, they will find their niche. They will be happy, they will be successful as they measure it, and in turn be good community members. 
Mm -hmm. And I think what you mentioned there, Jason, are key elements to, you know, one's measure of quality of life. You know, they're happy. They feel good. They've got their bounce, their step when they get out of bed in the morning. They're happy to go to work or whatever activity they're going to do. They're contributing to their community and their other areas, which in turn helps other people, you know, increase their quality of life. So I think those are all key factors, you know, as well. And I think it's a balance between all of them. And the reason why I say that is I know some people who, you know, really high salary, while money, you know, or income is obviously helps to contribute, but if you're miserable in other things, are you really happy and do you have a quality of life? If you hate, you know, getting up and going to work or, you know, I really don't want to do this, I think that can take a toll on somebody as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well the, the quote that, that I love that I put at each one of my emails is, uh, from Abe Lincoln, whatever you are, be a good one. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that really when it, it fits very well in education because it doesn't matter if you're, a, it doesn't matter where you're at. If, if you are a lifelong learner and you enjoy what you do, you'll be good at it. And, and really that's what we want. We all want to, to get to a level that we can be happy with our professional life, with our personal life, with the things we're doing in the community. And that's, that's a powerful statement. I would agree. With the educational process, you know, they always say, you know, we learn probably our brain will absorb as much in probably till we're about 10 years old or whatever, or whatever the figure is. Is there a certain age limit or age range that really is more influential or, or can be more directed than others, you know, in their, in the process? We, uh, we had career connections a couple weeks ago and we likened educating the young mind to a sponge. Uh, because students don't have those predispositions because they don't have that the information they get they absorb from all different areas um, but when you start educating the mature mind it's more like trying to pour water into a bottle you know they they, mm -hmm. they have things they're interested in and you have to get those interests to make sure that you can fill that bottle with knowledge and w when you see that and you can know that younger minds will take absorb anything they can older minds you need to be a little more prescriptive and you need to know that you're hitting those interest things to really make sure you're engaging them that's when you can really start saying that any mind can learn even uh, the oldest minds as long as you hit those pieces that they're looking for and, and again as you touched on the research is clear that the earlier stages of our lives are the most impactful for skills and abilities but as mike said there's no doubting it, it ties into that personalized learning if we can hook any student whether 17 or 77 mm -hmm. if they have interest it's engaging we can teach them mm -hmm. my next mm -hmm. question kind of ties into what you were alluding to mike is you know as times have changed how has education requirements changed with it to keep up with life and where i'm going with this is i'm working on initiative at my it position you know over at the city and i'm calling it the speed of life you know, used to say, you know, change at the speed of business or change at the speed of light or one thing that's constant is change. But what I've seen now through the technology and the rush of one's lifestyles, you basically have to keep up with the speed of life as it's changing. You know, so with that in your sponge analysis, is there some point you have to rig that sponge out so it can, you know, soak more or to that point? You know, I think the transition we're seeing in education right now is the whole mode in how we educate. Um, you know, if you go back five years to 50 years, the mode was the teacher was the person pouring the water on the mm -hmm. sponge, and then the students were the sponge absorbing it. And what we're seeing more and more now is, is with the information that's out there and the access we have, when the teacher can be the facilitator and the, and the sponge can kind of find their water with different ways and using technologies to use the World Wide Web um, to collaborate with their peers, that's the way education I see changing mostly. And it's not the teacher giving information, it's the teacher guiding the students so they can find it for themselves. Okay. I think the students are going along with the sponge mm -hmm. here, the students are the ones that will wring out the water. Yeah. And the students will be the ones saying how much water. And the students will say, no, I've had enough water. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, you know, that goes along with that piece is we are now more than ever, I think, asking students, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And providing multiple opportunities and allowing uh, students to make the choices. So that goes along with that personalized and again, mm -hmm. uh, providing engaging opportunities. Yep. 
because the more and more you throw at somebody, and that's where you come into the burnout factor. How right. much can you absorb? How much can you take before you just start to burn out? Right. Right. And then you shut down that way as well. Exactly. Uh, with the educational system, what types of distractions are you seeing? You know, there's lots of influences out there that may take students or kids, steer them down the wrong path. What's the, you know, what are some of the things that you're seeing now in the schools? I think the greatest impact or distraction that we're seeing is the change in our socioeconomic piece in our, mm -hmm. in our community. What we see in our community is reflected in our schools. Um, North High School, for example, is realizing the highest percent of free and reduced lunch numbers that it's ever seen. Ten years ago, we were at single digits, single percentages of students receiving free and reduced lunches. Mm -hmm. Now we're over 40 percent. And that has far-reaching impacts of what needs our students bring to our schools and subsequently what our families can and, and cannot do for their student mm -hmm. and our learning community. So for me, that's the biggest impact right now. And I would agree with Jason. I think that's the, the biggest. A close second, if I had to come up with one, it would be just the, the political uh, world that we're living in. I, I think education has gotten um, to be platforms for people to be elected, reelected. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's some really, there, there's some good things going on politically in education. I think uh, we're, we're needing to be as transparent as we've ever been. Um, and I think education, we're doing some really good things and you're gonna see, see in the next couple of years the great stuff we're doing. But there's other, there, there's other places, and I'll use Common Core as a really good mm -hmm. example. There's a lot of political pressure saying Common Core is Obama Core and all these other things. You know, Common Core does not tell us how to teach students. It doesn't tell us, the, it tells us really what a third grader should know in math. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the way the political climate is, people want to say that's a bad thing. And, and I look at it as we want to teach, we want to make sure our kids leave and they're ready, you know, ready to go, mm -hmm. they're lifelong learners. Give us where, where you want us to take them and we can take them there because we have people in our buildings that are, that are ready to make sure our students are successful when they leave. Okay. Our education, you know, it's a process, it's a journey. And one I'm going to say is they get an educational toolbox. You know, by learning you get your tools. You know, you become familiar with them. The way life, our lifestyles change, especially in our community. I mean, right now you hear there are jobs out there, but they're all specialized jobs where you know, they need training or they need you know, special skills. With the way times have changed, do you see the approach change as far as how we educate our students? Meaning, you know, it used to be, hey, you could graduate from high school, you could get a job at Kohler, or live well and retire from there. You know, then the, the um, method changed to, okay, you go to high school, go to college and then you get your master's and bachelor's degrees and all that. Well, you see those people out there, those kids, having a hard time finding a job as well. It's because you're almost overqualified or you don't have the technical skills like would you go to a LTC or something. How do you see that approach changing? I don't know if it's a, it's a change in the approach, but I think it's a re-emphasis on personalized learning, again, mm -hmm. but also of refocusing on the liberal arts comprehensive nature of a high school. Mm -hmm. We want our students to be exposed to many experiences to find their niche. Mm -hmm. So certainly have experiences in tech ed playing with metals and have choir experiences and good solid uh, science experience and the list goes on but to find their niche and once they find their niche we can take them to the next level and prepare them. Um, Again, if we provide engaging opportunities across the board, we're confident that our students will find that niche and then we can take them. And, and you know, I, I think the other thing we're trying to do is, is break down some of the bricks and mortars of the school and, and get some opportunities for our students outside the building. Because we know that there's a lot of learning that can happen outside of the classroom. And, you know, wh one of the things we know, and I think you're, with this question is we know there's going to be a skills gap looming mm -hmm. uh, as, as the generation, uh, the baby boomers start retiring. There's a lot of our employers that are saying, we don't know how we're going to fill these spots. And a lot of those spots are mid-skill and high-skill jobs. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure our students are ready for them. 
And, you know, some of the things that we're doing now is, is partnering with local employers and saying, you know, we have students that have shown an interest in engineering and they've taken some engineering classes here in our building. Can they do an internship with you to take some of the things they learned in the classroom and apply them in, in the workforce? And that model is really starting to gain some momentum in our community. And, and I'm really, I've been very impressed with Sheboygan County as a whole, the way people have opened their doors and let some of our students take what they're learning in high school. And they're finding out that high school students can be very useful in their doors and, and on their floors doing some of these things. And truly the level of education when we can have our kids apply those things in, in a job-based, mm -hmm. work-based learning opportunity um, just helps that learning skyrocket. And I think what we found is a common theme or a common foundation to whether we provide experiences outside the classroom, inside the classroom, is that we'll be providing students or giving them every opportunity to be exposed to some soft skills that are transferable to whatever job because it is an ever-changing world. So if our students can leave with certainly a love of learning, find their niche, but also have some skills such as teamwork, problem solving, importance of being on time, mm -hmm. um, collaboration, those things will always be with them and be transferable to whatever career yep. aspiration or journey it takes them. I know I had a conversation here a while back with the philosophy mm -hmm. professor, Dr. Blazecki, and he was my favorite professor here, Dr. And Sitting down when I was talking to him, I think it finally clicked you know, of why I, why I took classes like philosophy or introduction to filmmaking or these other things. And you had touched upon it. And I think you hit it right on the head, Jason, is where, yes, I went and I got my computer skills and math skills, you know, and I've got my toolbox, so to speak. But I think exposing yourselves to other things, and maybe I'm not a philosophy, you know, professor or anything, but at least it's those exposures that cause you to stop and think about something and reason your way through it. And I think that's where our society as a whole has kind of fallen off. It's either they're trying to make everything black and white, and it's not. I'm sorry, but life is not black and white. There's a lot of gray in the middle. And I think that's where our education needs to come through is how do we navigate the gray area? Because mm -hmm. to me, life is like, okay, you want to get from point A to point B, but it's filled with crocodiles in between, and you got to get on the right steps, and that's where the gray matter comes in, or common sense is what I define it as. Right. So I think that's why the more opportunities, you know, now I know why, you know, we had physical education in school, you got to think about that, the whole, you know, projects, everything, I think it all plays a whole role where it comes together, at least that's my opinion on it, so whether you agree or not, I don't sure. know. You bring, you bring back the sponge piece, we yep. want to fill those sponges with mm -hmm. as much different types of fluids and let the sponge make the determination of which fluid they like the best, which way, what's their path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the schools, what would you say are the distractions to the students? What negative things are, you know, you, that you, you know, constantly have to combat? You know, the whole heroin presence, you know, in, in around and, you know, other negative like gangs or anything like that. Do you see any of that in the schools? And if you do, what do you do to try and, you know, steer the kids clear of that? You know, one of the things that we've taken a, a big switch on this year is, uh, we call it the Red Wing Way, and it's, it's really, working with behavior but in a positive way and there's a, uh, th there's a lot of things going on in our community. We know there's that presence mm -hmm. of heroin, we know that there's you know different gangs and things like that um, but what we're finding is you know if you're going to make school the safe place to learn there's some high expectations that we have for students that they don't and, and we're going to focus on the positive and we're going to correct the negative behaviors. Um, and, and truly it's changed a lot of the culture in our building. So, you know, I know we, we did a presentation not too long ago. We worked with the police department and uh, uh, make the right choice, I think, to talk mm -hmm. about making poor choices and, and using drugs and things like that. Um, and, you know, the nice thing is, is the heroin thing we haven't seen in our schools yet. But I know our kids are dealing with it when they get home. I know yep. there's some of those things going on. It's just it's too prolific to not happening. Uh, so even though some of these things maybe aren't coming into our hallways, the effects of them are coming into our hallways. And, and those are the mm -hmm. things that, that we try to have a supportive culture in our building to make sure that our kids know that when they come to school, it's a safe place. And, you know, then it comes back to education. 
because because you have these things happening at home, education can be that key to unlock the doors so mm -hmm. you don't kind of hit those some of those same uh, same cycles as maybe people mm -hmm. in your family have. I think it goes back again to the impact that our change in socioeconomic uh, in our community has had. Mm -hmm. So again, similar to what Mike has said, we're, we're not seeing heroin in our schools, but we are seeing some other impacts that that decline yep. in, in, in income has had. Mm -hmm. And similar to uh, what South has done with the Red Wing Wing, North has North being North. It's it's the same thing, different sure. package, but we're focusing on what ownership looks like, what ownership looks like in the classroom, what it looks like outside the classroom, what respect looks like inside and outside the classroom, and then what does engagement look like? You're a student, so what does it look like to be engaged in the classroom? What does it look like to be engaged outside the classroom? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's positively impacted our culture. That's great news that you're not seeing. I mean, yes, you're seeing mm -hmm. the side effects. I mean, we'd be silly to say no if we didn't think it was, but the side effects are there in our community. Um, right. One thing I'll mention is you know, Dr. Howard Croft over at St. Nicholas Emergency Room, he's a medical director, and he does a fantastic presentation working with, I don't know if he worked with South and the, and the city police as well as you know the sheriff's department on the whole heroin initiative. And he does a fantastic presentation on you know, the causes you know, how do you detect it, the side effects and the results of it, you know, the side effects which you might be seeing the influence of in the schools as well. So mm -hmm. definitely. Um, and what you had touched upon as well, I know the, um, it almost comes down to our core values of what we believe in and teach. And it's nice that the schools have a environment where the kids can consider a ha safe haven and get them into these other programs like our broadcasting initiative yep. partnership to get them excited about it. We started out with 14 kids and now this coming fall, we've got 60 alternates, you know, among the other thing, and we want to do the same thing with the radio program and form a partnership. Right. So one of the core values, you know, that I got from my tenure over at St. Nicholas is their core values are respect, care, competence, and joy. And actually that comes from Springfield down at the Mother House for faith-based medicine. You know, you got to respect each other. Competence, you got to be able to do and, you know, meet your needs. Joy. You want to have fun at what you do, you know, mm -hmm. and then there's care. You got to care about what you do and care about others. And it fits in well with the whole model of a quality of life, I, I would think, so. you know. So thank you, Mary Brousseau, for sharing that with us because that's, you know, who was the CEO over there. And very influential person. And I, you know, I take those teachings right on to, you know, my position here, you know. Mm -hmm. And with those, you know, you talk about the other um, opportunities. And I had my introduction to filmmaking class. I'm going, well, this is cool. Later to find out in life, here I am with WSCS and I'm in front of the camera as well as, you know, the station reports to me. So it's just weird. You never know how it's, something's going to just fall into place. So. Right, absolutely. Right, very true. So um, what are some of the unique programs that, you know, at each of your schools or collaboratively working together that you have to help education and, you know, getting our kids steered off into the right direction? I think we're limited to 30 minutes here. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no doubting the number of, yeah. programs that sure. are ongoing and the, and being initiated but I think one that I would talk about between north and south is really the manufacturing pathway looking at building relationships with our schools and manufacturers to provide again more experiences for our students um, and it will provide a, a, another level of experiences so we'll have students that have gone through certain core courses or prerequisite courses, but now we'll take those skills and apply them to real life project-based learning. And a, the manufacturing one is, is something that, that Jason and I and our staff in both our buildings have been trying to build and uh, we're very excited to, to get that mm -hmm. uh, implemented. Uh, the one at, at South that, I, that we just got certified that I'm really excited about is our healthcare pathway. Kind of same piece that we're talking about with manufacturing, but we've worked with uh, uh, partners with the Wisconsin uh, School of Medicine and Aurora and Purveya, and they've actually, we've created a, a, we call them pathways for students that are interested in any healthcare job. So um, we're seeing from the creation of this, we had 50 some students sign up for classes to next year. I think we have 175 students that are taking these classes because they know these are the high school classes that can get you set up to go pre-med in college, go to nursing. 
Um, and, you know, as we find things that we always say kind of jazz students up and if they know that's uh, what they want to do, those are some things we're doing. We have manufacturing, healthcare, we're looking at computer science. Those are some of the really cool things that we're seeing in education because employers are willing to say we will partner with the schools to help create some of these things because we know it's just good for our community. Okay. I know that partnering, I think, is going to be definitely a way of the future because it almost works like a recruiting area. You know, we hired Lacey Fister from Sheboygan South through the broadcasting group. And in fact, she just did her first news show the other day, you know. So that's a win-win because, you know, it gives us a chance to teach skills or, you know, and let her know what we're looking at and get that experience where I know she wants to go into broadcasting. Yeah. So it's a win-win situation, you know. So it's kind of like training but extending their education into the real world. And, you know, one of the cool things, I'm, I'm a Sheboygan native, but I've been so impressed with Sheboygan County. Uh, we have a, a new company out there called Inspire Sheboygan County mm -hmm. that's a bunch of educators and, and employers that are getting together to help with building these relationships and, and build partnerships. And, and the amount of our employers and schools that are involved in it are just growing mm -hmm. on a, you know everyday type basis. And it's just really cool to see how our community gives back to the schools and how we really can have this really good discussion between the K-12 schools, mm -hmm. the post-secondary schools, and the employers that will someday our students will land in. Okay. Um, we've got a couple minutes left. So if you were to speak in front of a group about education and quality of life, what would be the advice you would give? What would be the audience? Students? Okay. Let's say at a student graduation, you know. Let's just say it for just, you know, for the sake of our time or whatever. Let's say if you had a, had a commencement ceremony. I, w I would talk about the hope that I had that they left North, specifically North High School, with again the soft skills such as teamwork, collaboration, problem solving. And uh, the hope that I would have that they take those skills and apply them to their next thing in life, whether it's work, whether it's college, whether it's the military, and the ultimate hope that they would be happy, successful, productive members of their community. Okay. I would go back to, to my, my quote I said, whatever you are, be a good one. Mm -hmm. And being a lifelong learner, picking the things that really interest you, that give you passion, um, continually to learn about them, and then be good at what you want to be. And, and if we can leave our students with that message, that education is the key to help me find a job that I'm passionate about, and also be good at what I am, that's a, that's a message I'd like everybody to leave with. Okay. Well, we're out of time, um, but I'd like to thank both of you for being on the show you know, to talk about this important subject. Um, on behalf of WSCS and Quality of Life, I'd like to thank Jason Bull and Mike Trimberger. Thank you. I'm Dave Augustine, and if you'd like more information about the show or this program, please just visit our website at www.wscssheboygan.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.